going on NPR and saying actually the the resurrection didn't happen. You're like, well, what he, you, what he didn't go on NPR and say that, by the way. <laughs> that was that was a reference to a conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before, so Matt's very clear um, with both me and the audience that the resurrection is a historical fact. <laughs> yeah. So I mean. Not not because it can't be demolished, but only because if you can't logically say I'm a I'm a Christian and I don't believe in the resurrection, just like you can't say I'm a construction worker but I don't know how to cut wood. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Unless you're a steel welder, but yeah. yeah, I think the the analogy holds. Um so I do want to get into our initial topic, but a lot of what you're saying sort of reminds me of <clears throat> um even when I was in Acts 29, there was a church um, in the Northeast, and I'm not going to name it, although this isn't a bad story. Um, but they were starting to teach the practice of uh, Lectio Divina. Um, mm-hmm. Lectio. Which, Lectio. <clears throat> um, forgive me. <laughs> so when, when I sort of read the Bible and used Bible plans, um, it was very much a straightforward reading, like, here are your four chunks for today. You know, you have the, the chunk out of what Jewish people would call the Torah, and then mm-hmm. the chunk out of the prophets, and then the chunk out of the gospels, and then the chunk out of the epistles. And, mm-hmm. you know, you have a paragraph in each, and you just kind of read it. Or you're doing, like, the read through the Bible in a year plan, so you have four chapters in Genesis that you need to get through, and then you have the next four, and you just, you know, go progressively through. Um, there's a few different ways you do that, either, like, when they were written, order they were written. Um, there's, like... You know, you journal, maybe, maybe you're just reading it. Um, there's some sort of like lowercase m meditation of like, oh, I wonder what that thinks, or I wonder mm-hmm. how that relates to my life, or I wonder how I should do this. And then you have the, the Lexia Divina, which is like, take one verse, mm-hmm. and like light some candles, mm-hmm. turn off your lights, shut off your phone, like go to a comfy chair mm-hmm. and like start repeating it and then think about, you know, like, mm-hmm. it's just a very different way of reading the Bible. Yeah. And I think it assumes a different, a different uh, scripture altogether. And I think that would be, like, my main point is, like, if you're reading it for, there was that song in the 90s, Bible is an acronym for basic instructions before leaving Earth. <laughs> like, that's not it. That's what I'm saying is, like, that's exactly what it's not. Yeah. Um but, and there's that, it's, it's another corny illustration, but, um, there's the, uh, the show Firefly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you remember the character? For the record, I love Firefly and Buffy and Angel, but I think, uh, Josh Whedon is a pretty terrible person. So I just want to put that up. Yeah. 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 yeah I agree. <laughs> yeah. Uh, great for, artist. Awful man. Uh, fair enough. But, um, there's the character Shepherd book mm. and, uh, the character rivers ripping out all the pages of the Bible because they don't, they don't make sense. They don't compute. They don't work mathematically. They don't work scientifically. And, uh, and Shepherd Book's comment is, uh, uh, you don't read the Bible. The Bible reads you, which I think is corny, but like pretty, pretty good summation of what I'm saying. Um, and that's what Lexio Divina does is it, it pulls out something about you as you're, as you're meditating on the text. And and then where you see where it becomes universal is and and that's the way I was I was uh, commenting before how it becomes universal is not intrinsic to the text itself but in the way that you relate what it meant to you to other people and then you find they're relating to it in the same ways and you don't really know how and you don't really need to know how and you're just like so the Bible's speaking something deep about humanity not just me as an individual yeah so. You know, when you mentioned the the song, I was trying to think about which Christian band that could be. And like the who's who's the band that wrote "Breakfast in Hell"? Do you, do you remember that song? <laughs> the Newsboys. Newsboys. Um, and I was like, that sounds like a Newsboys song. They've gone through like eight lead singers, and they're a completely different band at this point. But it's for me, what you're saying is like, I'm coming. If we're going to use late '90s, early 2000s Christian bands. I would say I came at the Bible much more like DC talk Jesus freak. And it sounds like you're coming at it like jars of clay. (laughs) (laughs) That metaphor makes sense to anybody. (laughs) Or sixpence none the richer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So, 
All right, so I think that's a good lead-in to, or maybe it's not, but um, sort of what I see is a new fundamentalism taking place, especially within the people who I'm Facebook friends with that are that are reformed. Um, and it actually leads in, I, I actually think the lead-in is when you were talking about science being this mystical thing that evolves, that mm-hmm. it isn't the capital T truth, right? Mm-hmm. And I think science itself never claims to be the capital T truth. T truth. I think um, often people of faith project that on it as a um, dialectically opposed to their faith. Yep. Right. Especially evangelical Christians. Like science can't be true because the Bible teaches this. And science is like, well, we don't even like we're exploring. Yeah. And seeing what is true. Um, or science can't be true because, uh, you know. They used to say this food was good for you, and now we've discovered that it's bad for you. Right. Co- you cholesterol. Right. Right. <laughs> or, or fat, right? Everything was low fat when I was growing up. Like margarine came out and, you know, yeah. stop eating butter. And then they're like, actually, it's sugar, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. the amount of articles that say red wine is good for you or red wine is bad for you. Or, like, it, so we can't trust science because right. it's always correcting itself. Well, and, and, and yes. <laughs> and, and here's where it leads into modern fundamentalism it is the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's not just Christians. Like there's a, a fundamentalism that's like some of my friends are part of um, and they've sort of got sucked into this conspiracy theory web. And they're going to disagree with those terms. But that's how I see it, or at least alternative reality, alternative reality. So initially the pandemic started and we had no idea what this virus was. And so people are sanitizing surfaces and, you know, trying not to touch things. And it mm-hmm. turns out, you know, a few weeks in, they're like, oh, it's respiratory. Um and so you should wear a mask. And people are like, oh, okay. And then they're like, cloth masks are fine. Well, it, I, even then I was like, I don't think they're fine. Like, yeah. you know, I know how small viruses are. <laughs> um, and, you know, it was partially because there just wasn't enough surgical masks. Um, and then I was like, you need to wear surgical masks. No, you should wear KN95s. And, like, the science kept evolving and figuring out what what is the um, k naught of COVID-19, which is how transmissible something is, is measured by its... Um, k naught factor. Um, so like measles is like 15, which is the highest we know. So like if someone has measles in the room and you're not vaccinated, even like two hours later, you're catching measles. Like mm-hmm. it's not even, it's just a given. You know, like the flu, I believe, depending on the or the common cold is like 1.2, which is like, yeah, you, you might get it, but you might not. Mm-hmm. Um, initially they thought like the K value for coronavirus was like off the charts. And then as people started taking measures, it goes down. Um, but you have all these people like we can't trust science because... Two years ago, they were telling us something completely yeah. different about the coronavirus. And like, yeah, because science isn't the capital T truth that's declaring this from on high. It's right. the best we know currently with the information we have. And as we get more information, that theory may or may not change. Mm-hmm. It's either going to confirm, like the data is going to confirm what we initially thought, or it's going to change. Mm-hmm. Right? So... Initially, I had sort of two strands of evangelicals on my Facebook Twitter feed. And one was like, we should stop meeting in person. We should make people wear masks. We should love our neighbors who are um, immunocompromised or elderly or too young to really afford getting sick. And so we're going to follow the government's, you know, request slash requirement to not hold services. And others who were like... This is just the flu. The government is trying to take control. This mm-hmm. is the new world order. This is like the book of Revelation coming true. Mm-hmm. Um, at the you know at the extreme of that, but at least like the science isn't settled. We don't know. It keeps changing. Like we're going to yeah. do what we want. Um, and from there, you know, a lot happened during the pandemic. Right? You have um, George Floyd. You have Black Lives Matter protests. You have now the split between anti. Did George was George Floyd killed during the pandemic? Yeah, or I slightly the before, year before that. Because no, because you know people were like, how can how come people can go protest for Black Lives Matter and not wear yeah, masks and they're not can, catching coronavirus? But then you yeah. know people are saying you can't have um, Sturgis in Montana, like you know, oh, it's a right. double standard. Like right. the liberal yeah, media yeah. are letting the so um, fact check. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so then you have this further split and then you have, you know, from that, this split with critical race theory, which like all of a sudden becomes an issue. 
mm-hmm. right? And so the, the, these people, at least the evangelicals on my feed, who are really against any sort of pandemic restriction, even wearing masks voluntarily, now pick up, you know, be an anti-Black Lives Matter. Um, and not that they're saying Black Lives don't matter, but they're saying the organization is terrible or all lives matter. Hey, what about police? And it's like, well, like, yeah, that's true, but that's not the conversation we're trying to have because we're looking at a marginalized group and saying, like, let's let them be not as marginalized. And instead of doing that, they're like, well, my life matters too. And from there, they pick up critical race theory. And mm-hmm. I don't think any of these people had ever read any critical race or any <laughs> critical theory before because critical race theory is like this minor offshoot of something larger, which is critical theory, which came about when Marxism failed, uh-huh. right? And these German philosophers in the Frankfurt School are like, why did Marxism fail? Like, we thought it was pretty good. Yeah. So they go back and they try to rework it. Um, and I doubt any of them before a few talking heads like mentioned critical race theory, never read anything about critical race theory. Uh-huh. So now they're against that. And currently, you know, so, so, you know, science is bad because we don't know about the coronavirus to the full extent. Masks are bad because science is bad leads to like black lives matter are bad somehow connected. Right. And again, it would be probably that science and liberalism are taking over and they're trying to kick us out. And they're trying to shut us down and quiet us in the public square, which like there's probably some legitimacy to that, Um, you know, because Dawkins says in one of his TED talks that you should absolutely ridicule anyone of faith and shut them up. Uh And I'm like, yeah, like that rubs me wrong, because if Christianity makes you a better person um, and, you know, going to church and doing Alexio Divina or even a street reading of the Bible, like keeps you sober or allows you to not be abusive or to overcome some struggles, like go for it. You know, I'd, I, I, I'd rather have that neighbor. Right. Than, yeah. Yeah. Then Dawkins, like, I, I don't want to, yeah. I, like he's, he, anyway, so it leads to critical race theory, which now the conversation is like Thomas Aquinas has infiltrated evangelicalism huh. and like they need to strip it. And like, and even today, um, one of my old seminary professors who I'm Facebook friends with is like, why do you think I'm railing against Aquinas? People are telling me like I shouldn't. And he's quoting, you know, these articles from what I think would be considered more conservative evangelical sources that are like young people are embracing Aquinas. Why you should too. And so like there is like this movement that hmm. natural philosophy has some apologetic value. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and these hyper reformed evangelicals have jumped from like, scientism which they would call the belief in science mm-hmm. um can't be trusted <laughs> uh, to like we need to kick aquinas out of reformed thinking because he's pre-luther pre-calvin and holds you know the magisterium and church tradition especially of the catholic church parentheses who are not Christians and we need to save them from Catholicism and convert them to right, right, true religion. Like that seems so fundamentalist to me. So Bob Jones university of like, we need to close all the doors, kick everyone out. Who's not in our camp, protect, you know, the remnant of 17 true believers who can also see that critical race theory and having black men, um, even black pastors talk about how like they get treated by the cops differently. Mm -hmm. Like that's awful. And Oh, now on top of it, a Catholic theologian is influencing us. Like the end times are upon us. <laughs> I know I just soliloquized, but let me let me try to unpack what I what I think I just heard there. <laughs> yeah. Um. So. So. You're talking about this movement to Aquinas from people who used to be anti-Aquinas. Is is that what is that? No, I'm saying there. So there are some evangelical apologists, especially uh-huh. who are like Aquinas has some value. Uh-huh. He talks about natural philosophy. Right. So if we're trying to convince people of the truth of Christianity, showing them that it makes philo- philosophical sense, sort of taking where they start is like in naturalism, right, or uh-huh. at least agnosticism, and saying, okay, you view the world. Aquinas has a lot to say about that, and he takes someone who, you know, and what 12th century would 
what a naturalist is then versus now. But he kind of says, like, let's look at natural philosophy, <clears throat> natural theology, and lead you to a point where I can convince you at least a God has to exist. Yeah. Right. 